Okay, so today we'll talk about some differences with IMFs and how we interpret that and come up with new and different uh, situations. Uh, I also have a little uh, visual that uh, hopefully will help you. Um, so the first thing I just want to make sure you're understanding, and if, tonight I hope you watch, uh, it's, it ended up being about 14 minutes of finishing that note, those notes. Uh, I, I attack the problems in some different ways. Uh, and Hopefully it kind of gives you a good a picture of everything. I had two molecules, you don't have to draw any of this in the beginning, but I just want you to continually understand something really important, is that you have forces in between uh, different molecules. I mean, you can just create anything you want. You don't have to draw this up if you don't want to, but I want you to understand the differences. That these are inter, and then in, anything I break inside of here is an intra, or an intra. Which one is involved in phase changes? Like if I go and go from a liquid to a, a gas, which would be boiling, let's say, or I condense something or anything? No? Interior. Inter, yeah, it's these, right? It's really about this energy that I try to overcome, and as I do, they start to separate. So it's breaking that intermolecular force. If I break a bond inside, it's an intramolecular force. Those are much stronger. Those are what we call covalent bonds or ionic bonds. These are just forces that are holding these molecules that still stay the same. These are both caffeine molecules. They still stay caffeine if I separate them and I break that intramolecular force. I think this is a good visual. So this is on uh, FET, P-H-E-T, uh, University of Colorado makes it. And what I can do is I can heat this up, and then you can see the temperature, or I can cool it down. And what I want you to see, and you could predict this, um, as a solid, these are all, uh, I, I believe, the, 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 the temperatures that are required to create a solid, liquid, or gas. So this is a liquid that's a gas. Okay. Well, if I hit argon, watch the temperature go up. Well, why did that go up? Well, argon is a bigger molecule than neon. Those are both LDs, but this is bigger. So it's a stronger uh, IMF. So like when I want to boil that, it's 189 versus 55. Th there's not much that keeps this together. The argon, there's a little bit, there's more stickiness. And then I go to oxygen, it's just a little bit more in, because there's two atoms on there. So there's, there's, it creates a little bit of a more complexity. And then water, it's going to have a huge number. And the reason why it's so big is that we have to overcome all those IMFs. But what I wanted to show, if I go from, I think this is interesting. So this is a solid. And I start heating this up. The interactions, because a lot of people are having a hard time understanding. Like, I don't know what you mean when we have to overcome. I have to overcome those attractive forces in between each of them for it to start to separate and get away. And as I do that, some of them can start breaking off and more and more, but look how some of them are still in groups because there's still a lot of attractive forces. Maybe they got a little boost. They're still kind of sticking together. And if I just keep giving it more and more energy, eventually, it's a little bit going crazy. Eventually, there's hardly any, any interaction. So now they're starting to group again. But the reason why those interact more, let's just go to something a little simpler, oxygen, is that they still have a lot of IMFs. If I increase this one with temperature, a lot more temperature, a lot more kinetic energy, they're not exactly flying towards each other because these are nonpolar. Like you can tell there's not a lot of change here. They're, they're just kind of randomly moving. If I drop it really fast just to finish this idea up, you can tell that they quickly you know, they start to interact. They start to group very quickly and now it's becoming a liquid and then it's going to a solid as the forces, the IMFs, are now greater than the kinetic energy that they have associated with them. And they'll slowly become more and more of a solid particle. Here we go. Now they're starting to get uh, stuck together because there's nothing else for them to be attracted to. <coughs> That's eventually they become solid. So something just to kind of play with. Um, and, and we can look at phase changes and everything else and we do the same idea here, okay? And then this deals with pressures and, and all that. So um, I'm going to have some questions that will kind of challenge you on that today again. Uh, and it's imperative you got to watch that video tonight because uh, it, it kind of finishes up some of the things that I just ran out of time to talk about. So a couple things that kind of look 
very familiar from yes, uh, from earlier today. What if I ask for lower boiling point? And I give you two options. And then I just say briefly. When I say briefly tomorrow, I want like one sentence tops two. I want you to indicate, this is what we're doing all year in AP. I want you to be able to tell me both. So you need to say, hey, this one has that and this one has this. Then you start saying the reasons. Okay, don't just start saying, talking about one and that's done. You haven't discussed the other, you will not get points. You have to at least tell me. You don't need the full sentences of why this one's higher and this one's lower. But you need to identify both and then say, well, because this has a lot higher or this has a lower IMF, this will be the re this will, well, I'm not being specific because each situation is different. In boiling point, the lower the boiling point, that means it's less energy to go from a, so a liquid to a gas. Right? So I don't need as much energy to overcome those uh, IMFs to go from a liquid to a gas. I can overcome those easier because I don't need as much. So this is at a lower temperature. So let's talk about each of these. Some of you, I strongly suggest drawing these out. So you could simply do this. Right? You don't have to do more than this. Like that could be what you draw there. And maybe this is what you draw here. Your first question tomorrow to yourself should be this. That is your first question. And if you want to bring your own ketchup, that is fine. first identify. So the pictures are great, but the pictures are not good enough for an answer. I didn't say draw, I said explain. So don't just draw a point and error and go there. Uh, you, need to, you need to talk about it. Um, so in this case, it, it's a little trickier, but uh, what do I have going on in my ethanol? Or sorry, my methanol. Anything? There's some LDs where? On the left or the right? Left. So I got some LDs going on. Anything else? I got a little touch of H bonding, right? Got a little bit, a little bit. What do I have going on there? What's in my water? That's all H bonding, isn't it? I have two. So I have H bonding times two. So which one's going to have a lower boiling point? The methanol or the water? Methanol. Definitely. The methanol. <coughs> I don't know. You tell me. Is it because of the LD? Well, what is LD? What does that mean then? Is that higher or lower? Lower. Oh, so I have a lower I So, what needs to be in your brain? This needs to be in your brain for sure. Right, that's the order. I gave that day one. You, if you were here or you weren't, it, it was on then in the videos, and then I rewrote it when we all came back. Right, and then we group them like this. Right, this is my polar. This is my nonpolar. Then ionic is just it's a metal and a nonmetal. So that's why I gotta say you gotta you gotta ask yourself: Is it polar or nonpolar first? You need to understand. Then everything else. It's about stickiness. IMS are like stickiness. How much are they bonded to each other? How much? Are they stuck together? So a lower boiling point, it means it's going to boil. It means that the, the literal molecules are going to leave and become a gas. So they're not as attracted to each other as they are able to leave now. So if I don't need as much energy to do that, that means they're not sticking to each other as much, and now they can leave. So that means I don't have as strong of an IMF to do that. The confusing part is the freezing points. Boiling point, usually people click with that. So yeah, more energy takes more to separate. Oh, so that's a stronger IMF. It's bonded more. It's like Red Rover. I was not very good at Red Rover. Everyone always came after me. I, I, I know this might be a surprise. I was very thin and very small when I was a kid. Actually, I was the shortest kid in my seventh grade class. Which was a little, that was a little tricky. Uh, but they'd always come running after me. And, and in the beginning, I tried. But eventually, I thought I was going to break my forearm. So I'd just let go. And then I'd run, and I'd jump, and they'd slingshot me back. So I'd never make it. Uh, same idea. The stronger the force, the more energy it would take to bust through. 
So however it works for you. Can't talk about Red Rover in the, can't talk about stickiness. So you can say stickiness, but you can't just be like, like a post-it note. Like that's not gonna work. Um, okay, let's relate this because these problems kind of uh, piggyback off each other. What if I want the highest freezing point? Again, you need to think about this in terms of energy because if you have to explain freezing point, freezing point gets confusing. So what does that mean, higher or lower temperature when this is gonna happen? The, the, the higher freezing point. The, at, a, at a higher or lower temperature, I looked at a thermometer. So if I had a thermometer, it's gonna be a higher temperature, right? So it's, let's just say it, it's up here, so this is a higher temp when it freezes, when it goes from a liquid to a solid. So again, you have these compounds, I don't know what they are, and they're moving at a certain speed, let's say they're going like this, there's a, an attractive force that will all of a sudden be greater than the kinetic energy, if we want to, I'm just trying to illustrate this in some way, when those IMFs become stronger than the actual force or kinetic energy, which is basically temperature, that's when they'll stick and become a solid, okay? So if it happens at a higher temperature, is this a stronger, weaker IMF? At a higher temperature, you might be right. At a higher temperature, am I moving faster or slower? So let's say, okay. <laughs> freezing point's tricky. So this is a higher temperature. Do we agree? This is a lower temperature? Energy. Do I, am I, if I, uh, am I moving faster or slower? Faster. I'm moving faster, I'm moving slower, correct? I, I think that's a good visual. So if I'm moving faster, these are flying by. So I had a lot more energy, right? If I'm moving slower, I don't have as much energy. So if I want to grab something that's moving really fast, I need to have, I need to be really strong to stop. Does that make sense? If it's moving really slow, I can be like, oh, okay, I got you. I'll pull you right in. So you can just mem pure memorize it, but if you have to do an explanation, it's trickier. In general, everything is stronger if I ask for a bigger. If I ask for a bigger freezing point, bigger vis uh, viscosity, bigger melting point, you're going to say stronger IMF. Except for, what did we learn today? Well, we talked about it earlier, but vapor pressure, and then there's another word for it, volatility or being volatile. They're, they're the same idea. They evaporate really easily. That means they're weak. It's the only two that are the opposite, but you should be able to explain it at a further degree. So trying to show you different ideas. Again, it's got to be greater than the kinetic energy. So you've got to have a stronger a force at a higher freezing point. So, same concept though. You gotta break it down. So, if you haven't already done it, take 20 seconds or so. You don't have to draw them out if you don't want to. But your question is first, first half actually, is that a ionic compound, because that'll win. So if it starts with a metal, that's ionic. Those aren't metals, these are not metals. Right, metal's gotta be over on the rock. So, my question then is, is it polar or nonpolar? That's where you need to go. And why do I say that? Because once you do that, then you can get into this spectrum here. So polar and nonpolar, then if it's polar, you gotta ask yourself, is it H bonding or the dipole dipole? And if it's nonpolar, then it's automatically London already. And again, this is the strength. This goes up in strength. Right? So the, the higher it is, the stronger it is. So what do you think that stuff is? And yes, I do expect that you would know what both these are. This isn't a guess. Second one, though, though, that's the dilemma. Is it my first or is it my second drawing? The second drawing. Oh, am I supposed to know that? Because P's and N's have five valence electrons, five dots. So it would grab on, right? You'd have those other ones. And 
So why am I needing to know? Because that makes it polar or nonpolar. Polar. <coughs> Bless you. So now my question is, these are H's. Is that H bondings? H bondings. You're not having fun with a P. P-H-O-N or something like that. Uh, it's it's F-O-N. So that is that is this dipole. That doesn't matter. It's actually going to be okay in this problem. But if you had to be specific, this is a dipole dipole. And this is what? London or LD. Either one. It always works. You can write either one. So which one has the higher freezing point? The phosphorus or the, the hydrocarbon? Phosphorus. Phosphorus. Because it has a stronger, this is what I would say. So this is my exact answer. Um, this, this is how I would say. CH3 is nonpolar, which would make it London dispersion or London while pH3 is polar, uh, having dipole-dipole IMFs. Uh, uh, those IMFs are stronger, which causes a, uh, a stronger uh, attractive force, causing a higher freezing point, something like that. I know I got a little wordy because I was adding a, a polar, nonpolar. You could just say, you didn't have to add a polar. You could say CH3 has London, while pH3 uh, is dipole-dipole, uh, which are uh, stronger IMFs, uh, those IMFs uh, to have a f higher freezing point, it would create. Uh, you would need a stronger force, which would uh, require the dipole dipole. I mean, you, all I'm, tr I'm just trying. I'm just trying to wordsmith. I need to say something about. I need a stronger force to create a higher freezing point, or it, there's more energy in the molecule at a higher freezing point, so I need a stronger IMF between the molecules. I'm just trying to come up with something to say that I just need a stronger force, or I need a stronger force uh, to create the phase change, uh, to, uh, to create the attractive force between the molecules. Um, any of that about the forces between them and them being stronger. That relates to the fact that you're telling me that you understand that a higher freezing point requires a stronger IMF versus the other side, which would be a lower IMF. I'm not having you describe and explain to me why it's a dipole-dipole. You don't need to talk about what a London dispersion force is. You don't need to tell me what a H bond ever is. Okay, you just need to identify the bonds, identify strengths, and then relate it somehow to the, to the phenomenon that you're talking about. Some of them are easier to talk about as I'm stumbling slightly through this one because I'm going, I mean, you could go at it like four different angles on that. But all I got to try to say is somehow with the phase change, you can talk about phase change. It'll be cooling down from a liquid to a solid, which will require more attractive forces. And again, at a higher temperature, you'll have a higher uh, freezing point, which you need a higher IMF. Well, however you want to word it. But you got to make sure you say no. Don't just say this, though. And this is the problem that I always have. This uh, pH3 has a dipole-dipole, which is stronger, which is what is needed to have a higher freezing point. And, and then I'm sitting here waiting. Well, what's the other one? You've never even identified it. You've got to identify everything in there, OK? You have to, or else it doesn't matter. And I will try to write that in my instructions. Be sure to include all, um, identify all forces first. But I shouldn't have to say that, because that, that's what a good argument is. You're laying it all out first, and then you say why. OK? OK. Um, I, I, I led into here. I just wanted to quickly just discuss. I didn't want this all over on this side. And then we're going to talk about um, vapor pressure again. You can just make a beaker with some water. But um, I'm wanting to make sure you are still understanding this as much as possible. So this is vapor pressure, and this is atmospheric pressure. And we're not really worried about that in this part of the chapter, but it will all relate eventually. So we have this pressure that's like coming off the surface of water. And we have this constant pressure that's pushing down on us. We feel it right now. If you got rid of that red arrow like that, it would be one of the most painful deaths you can think of. Your body would expand. Your eyeballs would come out of their skulls. Your bones would actually start to crack because your body would expand because nothing's pushing back on it. And if you don't feel like something's pushing on us, it's only because it's constant and you don't feel it. It would be a horrible, horrible death. You'd literally be exploding by expanding out. Last year, showed that a little bit in um, a bell jar with a uh, I made marshmallow, we made marshmallow men, and they expanded out because we sucked all the air out of those bell jars, and they just expanded outward. 
Hopefully you remember that. Uh, maybe not. Um, so, oh shoot, I'm really out of room now. So what I want you to do, I, I kind of wrote something here just as a reminder. So all about vapor pressure and, and things like that is that it, you can make any generic uh, molecule you want, but again, there's this force that we have. Okay, that that force between our molecules. So this could be water, this could be an alcohol, this could be anything you want. Is that remember, the stronger the IMF I have, um, the lower the vapor pressure I have. And vapor pressure is always the one that escapes people. I think of it still. This is where actually this word is the, in my opinion, the most important stickiness. How sticky. How sticky is something? Okay. It does not easily does not easily jump to a gas. That's having a low vapor pressure. That's having something that is low volatility. And we're going to practice this in one second. But if it's sitting on the surface and you blow on it and it jumps and it cools off, well, those broke off really easily. Like they're, they're not attracted to each other enough. And the minute you can break that apart, it has that energy to leak. So the greater, the stronger the IMF, the more likely it's going to stay in that, that phase that it's in. Same idea, like to melt something. If, if, if it doesn't take much to melt, you have a lower IMF. It doesn't take a lot. So if you have a really low melting point, my gosh, there are melting points that are negative 200 degrees. That means it's normally a gas at room temp. I have to get it all the way down to negative 200 just to slow it down enough to want to be together. It's a really bad divorce couple. They're just low IMFs. Here we go. My parents have very low IMFs. Uh, Q is more volatile than J. What if that was a test question? Okay, and then I follow it up with questions. So I give you a statement, I did this today. I don't remember what I wrote, I think it was viscosity. This one I'm saying it's more volatile. Q is more volatile than J. I would do this on purpose potentially, uh, making sure that you realize that there is no extra knowledge involved. Like you're not like, well, shoot, I, don't, I didn't research Q and I really don't know anything about J. Doesn't matter. Your job now before you go down here is you have to make sure you organize your brain into IMF strength. So if I say Q is more volatile than J, what I would write above each of these is an up and a down arrow. Which one is the stronger? Which one is the weaker? And especially if you're doing this in pencil, commit. Do this without waiting for me. Commit. Put it to paper. Put an up to arrow or a down arrow on each of these. One is stronger, one is weaker. Have the confidence in this. And if you're wrong, then you're going to remember this more anyway. Which one is which? Okay, simple statement. Not a simple answer. Simple statement. Q is more volatile than J. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Now, I haven't given you the up and down arrows for this yet. So, uh, am I doing an up or down arrow for Q? Q is more volatile than J. Down. down. It is the only one, right? Volatility and vapor pressure that if you say it's more or it's stronger or it's higher, it's less of an IMF. Right? It's weaker. It means that it evaporates really easily. So if you put something, if you put Q and you put J on your arm and you blew, now maybe they would both evaporate right away, but let's assume they're really far apart. The Q would feel cool, the J would not, because the Q would start to evaporate immediately. Because volatility is the ability to evaporate really easily. So now, what if I ask this, and I purposely waited so you could go ahead of me, I'm going to do one at a time. So what if I want lower boiling point? And I might just ask a simple question. I, I might ask for a reason. I might just ask, I probably would ask for a one sentence explanation. So let's just get to the letter though first. Which one would it be, Q or J? It would be Q. And what you could say is that it would take less energy. Like I'd be specific. Like this is what I would say. Something like less energy, wait, say Q um, with lower
What I did there is I stated why, so I, I, the reason why it has a lower IMF, and then I was just specific to the situation. I'm showing that I also understand what I'm doing. I'm going from a solid to a liquid. Again, if I ask for a single sentence, you've got to understand that I'm not looking for the most beautiful sonnet in the world. So I, I, I'm going to be specific. I'm going to be like one sentence, one to two sentences. Like, it's going to be brief. So make sure you always state the why. So you've got to actually tell me. Like, writing it up here is not an answer. That's, that's doodling to me. That's you writing thoughts. You're not in the problem. All right, what if I ask for, I'm going to let you do the next two. So greater vapor pressure and greater viscosity. Okay, so please answer those last ones. If you want to try, give, give me a, a, a brief sentence or less. I mean, it can be si uh, slightly fragmented in something like this because I haven't given a lot of information. So you can't be specific on what type of IMFs there are or anything like that. But... So it, it's hard because you're just relating to one's greater, one's smaller. But if, if you have a problem, that, that's fine. Okay, give, it a, give it a shot. Please. And you might be repeating parts of a problem. That's OK. But then there's got to be something maybe specific. I, the, the mini explanation, I don't want you to stress out as much about that because there are different angles you can take. But being right on which one has a stronger or weaker, weaker IMF, that's essential. We have to have that. About 30 more seconds. There's different ways to think about it. You can think of it as like the thickness of a liquid. Technically, it's resistance to flow. So if you had a tube of it and you dropped something through it, the slower it takes. Like if you have two tubes of two different liquids and you drop the same compound, like a marble, let's say, the one that uh, took longer to travel down, that means that liquid is more viscous. So you'll always hear that like on a car commercial for oil. you like viscosity. It, it, uh, it doesn't have viscosity breakdown. So it doesn't lose its thickness to coat your, your pistons and your engine and all that stuff. Um, if it breaks down, then you know, you're not lubricating your engine well. Um, so visco viscosity is two things. It can be the IMFs, and it's also the size of the atoms. If they're more complex, they get in the way. So they become thicker. It becomes thicker if they're really complex and clunky, I guess. Um, I'm more worried about the IMF part, though. Uh, larger vapor pressure, Q or J. Q, Q, because Q, I'm going to repeat the beginning, lower IMFs, and then what I would say is, and it doesn't have to be this exact wording, <coughs> and I'm kind of ad-libbing this as we go. Stuff off the top of my head. It's not like I had this prepared. I, I want to kind of make this authentic. This, this just one type of answer. I, I could have went about three different angles with this. You could you could literally talk about the forces between a solid and a I mean a liquid and a gas. How as a gas you need to overcome that attractive force from one or the other. Well, to me I interpret that as the IMF. So a Q with a lower IMF, they're not as attracted to each other, allowing them to become a gas. Yeah, I'm looking for something just short, something that you can relate. Last one, viscosity. Answer would be Q or J. J. And I, I'm kind of having a theme here. Again, just one angle. I, I, I had to make a choice right there. Uh, viscosity is about flow. I could have talked about thickness, cause the, the, the liquid to be thicker. Um, 
cause there to be resistance to flow, uh, cause there to be a more attractive force from one uh, molecule to the other. I mean, if you're really, if you don't remember exactly what it is, that right there, it, come, it didn't have to be viscosity, my last answer. Causing it to have a more attractive force from one molecule to the other probably will get you there, and you didn't even maybe know what viscosity meant. Like, oh, but yeah, that, that's right. Because you're just talking about that attractive force. What they're just trying to do is see if you can take that statement, and what I'm trying to do, this statement, and can you actually interpret it. So it's going to be a slightly tricky one. I had one earlier. I thought the, the best question I asked today was the one that I gave you three vapor pressures, and then I asked melting points or boiling points. I don't remember remember which one. Hopefully you remember that. So you had to do two steps. You had to think about IMFs, you had to think about what the vapor pressures meant, but then you had to relate it to ranking the boiling points. So you had to say which ones were stronger or weaker and then translate. So, very fair question I could ask about anything. Uh, vapor pressure and volatility are going to show up there somehow because they're opposite ones. If I ask, if I take those two out and everything else I could lay out, boiling points, melting points, all that, it's all stronger or weaker, right? This one's stronger. Okay, well then all these are stronger because of that one. So there's probably going to be an opposite. Speaking of opposites, what if I throw a monkey wrench into it? And I link stuff. What if I link all these and I ask, which one is the right one? Or maybe you have to identify what is actually the right one or which one's wrong or, or whatever. So this is kind of a complex problem, but it's actually an easy outcome to this. So what is, which one has the correct IMF link? Is what I'm basically asking. So I tried not to make this too complex. I will say, definitely watch the video of the other one tonight, because the first problem I asked some different things. Like one of them said, what type of IMF or force, I said, what type of force is overcome when you dissociate F2? When I dissociate F2, here's the thing. You're dissociating. That means you're breaking that apart. You're not breaking, you're not breaking that apart. You're not breaking this apart. When you break apart F2, you literally are breaking that apart. So what are you overcoming? What is that called? When you break that. And that that's an intra molecular force, isn't it? But when I boil, F2, I'm overcoming what, specifically? What, and it, and I, what if I say be very specific? What if I have to, so if I ask for bond energy or dissociation, that's an intra. What if I ask for uh, a boiling, if, there, if I'm going to boil it, what am I overcoming exactly? What are those inters? What, what inter, there's three IMFs. Is that a dipole? No. Nonpolar is not an IMF. London. I'd be overcoming a London force. Watch, watch it's the first minute of a lecture. We just didn't get to it. Uh, it, it. It's just more examples that we could ask, that I could ask. Like it's all the things we talked about. I put it in a potential structure that might help you. Okay? So please watch it. Okay, so let's talk about it. I want the correct IMF link. So I have H bonding. It doesn't hurt to write it out. Okay? It doesn't hurt. Now, it doesn't say what I'm actually doing to these. So I probably have to be very specific. And if I write IMF, then what I'm talking about, just so you understand, right, I'm talking about that then, right? The force between molecules, not within molecules. An IMF is between, but if I ask for any force like I just did, uh, and I'm going to be very specific, like explain any force that is occurring that I have to overcome or break, well then that's different. So this, I have to come over, overcome that. Is that H bonding? No. Just because it has hydrogen in it doesn't mean it's H bonding. So if that's not right, what is the actual answer? London. So that wouldn't be right. If I asked, find the right one. That would be London. BCL3, I, and maybe there's more than one right one. We'll find out. BCL3, dipole, dipole. Hmm. You got to draw it out. So 
One of those. The trigonal planar or trigonal pyramidal? Planar. B is an exception. B and AL. And you can only have three. Right? There's only three dots. So, what does that make it? London. Did you say London dipole, though? Oh, uh, you do a catch-up. So that is, that is wrong. That is also London. Because it's nonpolar. So then you get to something like this. And you may not have, I'm not asking you to draw everything, but that, that's what this is. <coughs> covalent compound. Covalent compound is anything that's a non-metal and a non-metal. You're sharing electrons. This is definitely sharing electrons. You have double bonds. You're sharing. But am I breaking that double bond? No, I'm overcoming. I'm overcoming that force, right? I'm not overcoming an intra when I ask for an IMF. And I know that's confusing because they both can be substituted as IMF. But we're trying to talk about IMFs as the intermolecular forces, the forces in between. And I might be more specific. I might actually say, like, if all these were boiled, the minute I say boiling, you're doing a phase change. Phase changes do not change anything. You didn't boil water and magically you made a new substance. I'm making oxygen because I'm not breathing well. I'm going to boil water. Like that, you're not making that. That's not what happens. So, is that right then? What am I overcoming? What are these? All comes back to this, right here. This is all that matters. What is that? London dipole ionic? Yes. Watch now. What? No. The, if I broke that, yeah, I'm overcoming a covalent bond. But that's not what I'm doing. I'm overcoming this. These are both nonpolar. It's just a coincidence. It's not that every answer is London. It happens that these three are. A lot of things are nonpolar in this world. So. That's London as well. So whenever I do a problem and I throw in something that looks like this and I write ionic, I, I don't want to confuse people and trick them, but I usually get everybody on that one. So you go, oh, ionic, that's totally ionic. That's an acid. An ionic compound has to have a polyatomic ion in it, or it has to have um, a metal. So if I look at this, that's what I'm looking at. Okay, that has a dipole basically. Well, how do you know that? Because they're different and it's not a metal. They're different and it's not a metal. They didn't come together as charges. And I know that's confusing because in acid, you kind of do have charges because the H's kind of come in like H2SO4. You have SO2, SO4 two minus. But this would not be declared as an ionic compound. It's more of a, what is it? Dipole, dipole, or hydrogen? Dipole, dipole. It's not, you know, I haven't found with it. So that's not right. So we come down to two. And there are only two. So take a moment. Please find the one that's right and label the one correctly that isn't, if you can. And not that. I would always leave the answer to the last two if I did this, just for the sake of uh, review. It's nice not to have the first one be the right one, because then it's kind of pointless for us. So if you haven't already labeled it and circled it, you can do so. Ketchup helps. People listen to this, like, why do they keep talking about ketchup? Uh, aluminum or sodium, which one? <laughs> That's all I hear. <laughs> is this London or is this a network? And I know right now, the minute I wrote that, some of you, your anxiety just went up. You're like, we don't talk about that much. We'll get back to that in a second. This is London. The reason why is that aluminum and B, boron, are both exceptions. This is a nonpolar compound, so this is correct. It's nonpolar. All right. I would do something very obvious if I ever throw a network. Yeah. Oh, 
It it is. It is. Um, but um, that's that's tricky. It, it aluminum boron. It, it's tricky. It, it's actually a great question. Um, they hover on that line of whether or not it actually is coming together and sharing electrons or uh, um, or crisscross. And the reason why, like, if I show you something like this, like, how do you? Uh, wait, let me. If you had something like this, this is much tricky. This one, first off, how do you even draw that? There's no center atom. I mean, what do I, what do I have here? Do I have like, like what, where, what, what's the structure? So those are those are ions coming together. But um, you know, I now that you say that, I probably would not use this one on the actual test just because. But this, because it has it has three valence electrons. I can put it together without sharing charges, even though that could come together could come together as charges. This can behave as both. I'll say this: all the other ones are completely wrong, so you you would have to default to this one. No, well, you're throwing me not for a loop, but you're you're putting a hole in my problem here. Um, why isn't this a network? First off, what is the answer? That's ionic. That that's Na plus the Cl minus. So that is definitely ionic. Okay. So if a network showed up, by the way, and the only ones that are going to show up are things that are just silicone or just carbon, and the only other one that I'm making you responsible for is SiO2, that's quartz, and that's going to be a really rare question that I would probably guide you towards it saying already that it's a network solid. All I need you to know, this is all you need to know, is that that would come up, that would come up, and think of it this way, diamond is very strong, right? So that's going to be the strongest IMF possible. Diamonds are strong because it's such a network. It's like this just um, unending uh, network, that's why it's called it, of bonds that you have to all overcome. You're not overcoming like, like magnetic forces or attractive forces. You're literally overcoming these overlapping bonds that are happening over and over and over again. So that would probably really not come up in here because I have said from day one that I want you to focus on this path. But I do expect, and I think it's fair, that if I throw network in and match it wrong, I'm okay with that. I can live with that every single time. Like you should go, oh well, there's no carbon or silicone. That's not an, an unending compound. Okay? Please be careful. Last little comment on that though. If I throw this out here, the reason why that's not network is there's an ending. There's a beginning and an end. This does not go on and on. These are H's and that's done. It doesn't bond to another one of these and another, and it keeps going. But that is done. That is all by itself. It doesn't continue to go on like a diamond where it's just carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon. To carbon. Okay? So that would be the answer, and that's where we go. We do have two more things, but if you watch the like half of the video that we did at the ending, besides the things that we talked about today, and any of these kinds of questions, these are the things that are going to be under quiz mark. Okay? I am recognizing that we have had limited time, and I am recognizing uh, the overall situation. So I guess I'm having faith that you have been studying the things that we've, I've been presenting. So I have faith that I'm going to have the quiz in the way that I've been presenting them to you. And I'm not trying to kill your grade on the last quiz or anything else like that. I'm trying to see, do you understand the things that I've given you? Okay? It's going to be 15 points tomorrow. We only have 25 minutes. So it's not going to be a long quiz at all. Um, and that, that's what we have for tomorrow. I do, and I think it's important, this is also on the video, we're going to quickly do two more things, and I always say we've got to get out of here by four. Um, I want to show you what we're going to be doing for our Monday. So I have two more problems to do, if uh, you'd like to, and this, one of these is on that video as well, so you get two of these. Uh, what if I ask you to make, it's really simple, it's really not hard at all, and then I could ask some simple questions about it. What if I ask you to make a phase diagram for me? As much as this seems like it's totally out of nowhere, you, we can do this, okay? So, what if I give you a table, and it's already somewhat written out, meaning this, like I'd already put temperature, and I'd always, I already put pressure on my X and my Y, okay? I want to show you how you could do this. By understanding a few simple spots on the, the phase diagram, you can make it very generic. It doesn't have to be perfect. I'm not taking out a ruler. I'm not checking your scale, okay? So what you're going to do, I have freezing point, boiling point, critical point, and triple point. I'll talk about each one as we go. These are main ideas. So first, 
I notice that both these are at, let's, let's establish this as atmosphere. And I know that this has been a little frustrating for me that we couldn't get to this a little more. So I want to continue to show it to you after semester, but um, I'm, I'm kind of just cutting it off saying, can you do this? Or could you read one? Okay. This is my suggestion. This is standard conditions. So if you put a zero there, that's standard. Okay. What they usually do is the freezing and the boiling point is you don't have to put the dotted lines, but if you do, um, a lot of times this is where they put just to keep it so they can figure out where things are. Like this is my, you don't have to write that there, but I'm going to. That's my freezing point, like that line. Technically it's that dot. Okay, so I'm going to put a dot there. So that's 1 ATM and negative 20. It doesn't have to be to scale, it just has to be right. Like you can't put a negative 20 on the right side and 100 on the left. So don't worry about scale, just make sure that you're, you're, you're having things numerically in order. So if I put a 75 here, I know that's not boiling point up here, that is. Right, so they both intercept the one ATM. Today, I didn't talk about it a lot. It's hard to understand, and if you don't see it, you're not going to get it regardless. A critical point, after the critical point, you can't tell the difference between a liquid and a, sol and a gas. Like, you literally can't distinguish anymore. It's really weird, and it's really hard to get to. And you can see, 7.2 ATM, that's seven times more pressure than we feel right now, which we can't actually experience. You would, you would get crumpled very hard. So what I would do, I'm not going to make a table that now goes seven notebooks up, okay? I just write this up here, and what you can do, if you just make a jagged line like that, what you're basically announcing is I'm not going to scale, okay? And now I'm at 175. I don't care where it is. If you want to make a little jagged line, that's fine, but even this is going to be good enough for me. So that's going to be right here. Notice I'm just plotting them all. If you watch the other one as well, you're going to see, oh, it's really similar. It's all that he did. And then lastly, triple points. Just find the spots. So this is 1, negative 15. Um, so if this is 1, oops, that's not a negative. That's not there. Sorry. So it's like half of this. Right. So what's the point? The point is this. So that, oh, I didn't. All I got to do is connect them. So if you just look at the pictures and everything else, this is how it looks. You have three phases. The key is your triple point. The key is your triple point. The fact that the triple point is to the right of this is everything. So if I ask you to label stuff, what phase is this? Solid, liquid, or gas? All in here. Just think logically. Think about temperature and everything else. Give me my solid. I just write a big S. What would be in here? The liquid. Just think about the one ATM is your standard like, like normal life. So the colder it is, that's a solid, right? Then it becomes a liquid. Then it becomes a gas, right? Okay. What if I ask, is the solid more dense than the liquid? And then I write. Explain. This is a very common question. Is the solid is solid more dense than liquid? The key, oh, I don't know if I drew it right. The key is this relationship right here. If this was shifted over, I'm just going to draw a generic picture, it would look like this, like that. And that's everything. That little slope right here is everything versus this way. So is the solid more dense, yes or no? It's less dense. And you know how you explain it? It's real simple. Just talk about the slope. The slope is negative. That's what I would say. You could say the area of the liquid is over the solid, but that's not as scientific. So you can just say, well, the slope is negative, so that causes this to be less dense. So uh, if you have to draw that, that's the key, is the fact that this is more to the right. Uh, what if I ask this? Oops. Um, What 
What I'm trying to get at is you are going to be responsible for one last thing on here, and it's this. What are the names of each process? So I'm going to do it in a creative way. If I'm at point three ATM, so I'm down here somewhere, right? Okay, and I'm at negative 40, so let's just say I'm right there. I don't know. And I start to increase my temperature. So am I going to the right or am I going up? I'm going to the right. It's important that you understand. If I said that I'm here and I say uh, I increase pressure, that means I'm going up. What I'm trying to do is get you to go across the border, across the boundary. What's the name of that process when I shift from that state to the other? I'm not going to. I'm not going to say when you go from a solid to a gas. I'm going to see if you can do it on your graph. So when I do that, what's the name of that? Sublimation or sublimes, right? The one that you need to study, because it's, it's probably new to you, is deposition. That's where? Gas. Gas back to solid, right? I mean, there shouldn't be anything else. Wait, is that a liquid to a solid? It's not like, wow, well, deposition's happening outside today. Um, you've never heard of it probably before. Okay, so that, that's the extent. If you watch the other example online as well, on the video, I think you'll feel <laughs> a lot better about it. I really do. Um, and then lastly, which you do need to do this on your uh, lab as well, and, and I get it, it's a little tricky. You might need to clean up your lab. I'm still meaning to write an email to everybody. Like, if, you're, if your uh, uh, heating curve is a little uh, chunky, like a stock market, you'll need to do kind of a ghost line to make it a little cleaner, uh, which is fine. Uh, some people, as the ice cubes hit the thermometer and then off and then on and off, it, it creates the thing. Some of you have five graphs. Some of you have some other things. Some of you lost all the other graphs but the one. All right, you don't need to write all this. It'll come in here. But if you were given, this is all given. This is the only other thing. You might only have two problems on Monday. The whole point, I, I, I'm wanting to make sure that we have uh, time to start our, our, our final as well. How much energy is absorbed by 15 grams of ice at negative 5? This is our last problem of the day. If it is brought to 125 degrees. Okay? All this stuff, again, don't write it right now. And you can always watch it later unless you really, really want to write it. Um, this is a heating curve. Why? Because I'm going from ice and I'm going to 125 degrees. Personally, for me, I think it is very wise to draw a dummy graph. And I think it's extremely wise to number them. This is not a real thing. It's not like these actually have that, like, oh, no, step five. It's always step five. But it is really hard to explain to me, or to you even, if you're getting lost at what part are you doing when. OK? So I want to start from the beginning. So think about this. I'm at negative five degrees here. Okay, like temperature goes up. This is 10. I'm ending at 125 degrees. You don't have to write on it if you don't want, but did I do too many phases? No, I didn't. Now, if you want to write them all, you definitely can. Like that's a solid, that's a liquid, that's a gas. So then what are those flat lines? Those are my phase changes. And what's crazy is the temperature doesn't change. You can sit in a restaurant and all your ice cubes can slowly melt until that last ice cube melts. It has stayed at the exact same temperature that entire time. And you can keep checking it. It doesn't change. Yeah, but it's melting. Yeah. So all of those molecules are slowly overcoming those forces, but all that energy is going into the phase change, not the increased temperature of your water. So I need to do one stage at a time. So first I have to do that. All inclines are MCAT. I think numbering is vital. But it's not necessary. You could write like solid. You could write solid to liquid. But if you just numbered it first, like in the corner, now I know what you're doing. And I think that's more important. We're going to probably go over by two minutes, but sorry, I think it's important. Just do one more of these. If you need to go, go. So it's MCAT, right? MCAT. So Q, which is something you don't even have to memorize, the Q part. MCAT, mass, specific heat, change in temp. That's all. OK, so here we go. The mass, water is really uh, good if I gave you milliliters, but I'll give you the mass. So I, I have 15 grams. Make sure it's not in order. Make sure you're using the right one. Okay. It, you, whoa, whoa, whoa. You never said where the steam was. You, you need to know. You need to know what that means. So this is of ice. And if this says C sub ice, well, that's specific heat of ice, specific heat of liquid, specific heat of steam. So that's 2.1 joules per gram. Okay, today we did a cooling curve. I just wanted to do a different one. And then 
It's really important that you do the right change in temps. And people mess this up all the time. I didn't give any other information. There's something you need to know, and I'm amazed how many of us forget this. What am I writing? What's my change in T? What's my actual numbers? Zero? Where do we get the zero? I didn't write zero. I didn't say that. You need to know, I'm going to probably do a water one. And it's amazing how many people are like, well, they didn't give it to me. And then you say, ah, it's zero. Oh my god. Don't write 32. Fahrenheit's an F word. So this is zero degrees. Okay. So you get this number, and right now that's in joules. And I know that because it's in my specific heat. You gotta make sure each of these are in the same units. I would not mess around with a constant. Okay, I'm gonna quickly do all of them, but I we can go a little faster. Actually, I'll just go a little slower on the next one, and then the next three I'll go faster, because there's only two types of problems. Second one, now that's a phase change. So I need to save the amount of energy. So I have 15 grams of water. I did this one kind of today. I need to get into moles. And the reason why is that the heat of sorry, not thinking now. The, the vaporization and the fusion enthalpy values are in kilojoules per mole. Whenever you see per mole, your mind should go, wait a minute, they gave me grams, there's a mole. Oh yeah, I need to get that into moles. Don't shortcut this, do a t-chart, do it nice. Just so it's been said, which one am I picking right now, vaporization or fusion? Even if, vapor, even if one of them sounds foreign, the other one shouldn't. Fusion. Vaporization, we've heard that, right? Vapors, it vaporizes, it becomes a gas. Fusion is when we're fusing it together. So going to a liquid to a gas solid or a solid to a liquid, that's the fusion. So should I write 40.7? You could, you're going to have to do work later. So to me, I don't want to do more work. I want to get it, I want to get it done now. You need joules because you had joules before. So that's another number. These are all going to be positive, by the way, because I'm putting heat in. And the reason why I know is that the 0 minus negative 5 will become positive. So this number is positive, so all these need to be positive. So now, moving forward, going a little faster. Now I'm going up the, the incline again, so I have 15 grams. I make sure I do the new, bless you, the new specific heat. And now, what's my temp? What's my change in T? I didn't write the other one yet. What am I ending at here? You need to know that one. I think it's just important to say it. It's 100 degrees, isn't it? Right, boiling is 100. Please don't think back to your lab and go, well, ours was at 98.8. I had people do that years ago. They're like, yeah, but ours was. This is, this is a test with no specific region where you are or what the pressure is, so you go to default. The final is 100, the initial is zero. Okay. And now I'm just going to kind of fly through this, just to make sure that you've seen it. Now I use that vaporization. Enthalpy value. It should be a lot less. It doesn't take as much energy to overcome liquid to gap. Wait, did I just, oh my, no one said anything. I know. I just was saying all this, and I'm like, don't forget to mess it up. And why I just realized, I'm like, it doesn't take more energy, it takes less energy to over, I'm like, no, it doesn't. It takes a lot more energy to overcome a gas. Whoa, big problem, huge problem. I would have lost some points. Not embarrassed to say it. Wow, that was a big mistake. And we even said it. I even said that's fusion, and then I go to vaporization. That was dumb. Please double check it. Wow, sorry. What a great review of what not to do. Thank you. All right, final one, which actually a lot of students mess this one up. Not that. Steam, put the right one. But change in temp at the ending. Sometimes people just make this mistake, because now it's not set anymore. Where am I ending? I ended at 125. And where did I start on this increase? I started at 100. It's from the phase change. So you're going to get all these joules. I'm so sorry about that mistake. 
and you'd add them up one time. That's not tomorrow. There is no phase diagrams or heating curves. So if uh, the video, I tried to do it, I tried to stop uh, or separate it. So once you get the phase diagrams and heating curves, if you want to stop that for now and be like, oh, I'll watch that other part later, that's fine. Please watch that other video uh, tonight. Uh, and we'll have our small uh, quiz uh, tomorrow. Okay? So, all right. We'll see you later.